scripture reading this morning is found in Luke chapter 2. It is the birth of Jesus story. I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 14. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius went to their own town, excuse me, while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. And may God add a blessing to the reading of his word this morning. Thanks, Anna. And what a, what a prayer for each of us that Christ would be born in our hearts and um, would truly, truly live and reign in each of us. Second scripture reading this morning is from Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23, and where the Gospel of Luke uh, tells the story of what was happening 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Paul in Colossians uh, really describes and unpacks uh, the meaning of the coming of Christ in this passage. And so we'll be looking at this before we uh, really dig into God's Word together. Colossians 1, 15 to 23. The Son is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you wholly in his sight without blemish and free from accusation, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, we do thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that through your word you can touch us, you can transform us, you can speak and breathe life uh, into, our, into our lives. And that's what we ask, is that you would be born in us and that you would speak your word of life and truth into every heart that is here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning we are continuing our series called The Advent Mission. And again, Advent simply means coming or arrival. And during Advent, we focus on how Jesus has come Uh, 2,000 years ago, Jesus came and was born in Bethlehem, but we also anticipate during Advent his second coming, that at any moment, at any time, Christ could return in the clouds. And when we think about Advent, we focus on both aspects of his coming, his coming in a cradle 2,000 years ago, and his coming in the clouds at any moment when he will come as King of Kings 
and Lord of Lords. And so that's the Advent part, and the mission part can be summed up in John 3.16, one of the best known verses in the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And as people believe and put their faith and trust in Jesus, one heart, one life at a time, the kingdom of God shows up in that heart. And that person is born anew, they're born again through the Holy Spirit as they trust God through faith, and and their sins are forgiven, their outlook is brand new, their understanding that they're not living for themselves, but they're to live as a child of God. All of that changes as people surrender, as we talked about last week, put their faith in Jesus and his life, death, and resurrection, and as they invite the Holy Spirit to come into their lives and lead them and guide them. And that's what the Advent mission is all about, God sending Jesus to this world to transform every human heart, every life, as God does that work of redemption and restoration in this world that he loves so much. This morning, I want to begin by telling you the story of 1968. And when we really think about it, every year is 1968 because every year has tragedy, every year has pain, every year has those major headlines, uh, every year has its ups and downs. And so this morning we're going to focus on 1968 and what a dark and difficult year it was in our country. Uh, Just a few uh, high points or low points, we might say. Uh, On January 30th, North Vietnam launched the Tet Offensive against the United States and South Vietnam. And this was a coordinated attack between the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese that that targeted 36 major cities throughout uh, South Vietnam, and it caught the U.S.-led forces by surprise, and it was a major event um, that was uh, really hard for our nation. Um, Also in January, January 23, 1968, the Navy warship USS Pueblo was captured by North Korea. And over 80 soldiers were taken into captivity, and they were starved, they were tortured, they had to go on TV and say that they were being treated well when really they weren't. Uh, After 11 months of negotiation, finally, they were uh, released from captivity on December 23rd, and they were allowed to return safely into South Korea, South Korean territory. But the USS Pueblo remains, uh, I believe even still today, in North Korean custody, and uh, that was another really uh, dark, difficult period for our nation. Uh, things continue to, to be bad. I'm a real downer to start, start. Just I acknowledge that. It gets better, I promise. But on April 4th, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated uh, in Memphis, Tennessee. And the famous civil rights leader was only 39 years old when he was assassinated. And that sparked, uh, after his death, there were protests and race riots in the streets of more than 100 cities. If you can imagine, uh, some of you lived this. Um, I wasn't quite born yet, but... Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. And then just two months after that, the Democratic presidential candidate, Robert F. Kennedy, was assassinated in Los Angeles. And there was violence a couple months after that at the Democratic National Convention in August. And we'll talk about uh, a little more about 1968 a little later, and we'll get to the good part, I promise. But it was a year of turmoil. It was a year of death. It was a year of war. It was a year of pain and suffering. And I say that every year is like 1968 because we don't have to go back in time to 1968 to see that in our world we still have problems and conflict and brokenness and war and pain. Uh, There's conflict in our lives, you know, right near to us and we see conflict uh, raging around the world. Uh, Every year brings with it darkness and fear and anxiety and we are reminded Uh, whether we go on social media or turn on the 24-hour news stations, that our lives and our relationships are still today messed up. I don't know if that's news to anyone or maybe a wake-up call, but we know that there's so much pain in this world that God created. God created us to love him and to love one another, for us to walk in fellowship with each other, for us to enjoy the blessings of this world, to look around and be in constant awe and praise over how good God is because of his provision in our lives and the blessings of other people and the blessings of of being able to work and to provide and and enjoy this creation. And yet so often, rather than seeing peace and harmony, we see conflict and division. And instead of having peace in our hearts and singing Silent Night at at every moment, uh, we're filled with anxiety and stress and unrest. 
Uh, That might be in our own lives, our hearts, our minds, or maybe in our relationships or our families or in our community, or certainly we see it in our nation. We see conflict and turmoil, and we certainly see it in our world. You know, nowadays, if... uh, you know, someone does harm anywhere in our world, instantly we see it on social media or on the, the, the cable news stations. We see uh, at any moment everything that is wrong with our world. If a politician says something that we don't like, that doesn't happen very often, but if a po- <laughs> I'm just saying if you're awake. If a politician of either party says something that we don't like, We instantly know about it, and then we have that going on in our minds. Or if somebody on Facebook says something that we don't like, we instantly see it, uh, and and we can become consumed by that. Um, If we see something on social media, maybe it's not something like conflict, but maybe we just see, you know, something that makes us envious, and then our hearts are not at peace because look at all that they have, and my life is not that beautiful or orderly, you know? I mean, here I am, maybe we're thinking, sitting by my ugly artificial tree with a messy house and kids that are fighting, and I go on social media, and there's a video of the, the beautiful family that's, you know, that's taking a horse-drawn carriage into the woods, and, you know, and they're, they're, they're sawing down their Christmas tree as their children are playing Hark the Herald Angels Sing on their violins, you know, and it's, you know, we, you know, we compare ourselves and we think, man, my life just doesn't look like that, you know? And so that envy and jealousy, that can make it so that we don't have peace and contentment in our lives. It gets worse. I, I, hopefully you can take it. When we have anxiety, the problem is then if we have anxiety and we don't deal with it in a healthy way, then we can just perpetuate the nonsense uh, on our own. You know, for example, um, You know, some people might choose to self-medicate, and they can get into a whole host of problems that way. Or people might just escape into their world of social media and screens and technology and and kind of shut themselves off to others, and that usually doesn't help a family to grow together in love. Um, You know, other times people might get together and just have all this anxiety and unrest, and so they they gossip and, and sow seeds of division that way. But none of these are healthy ways of dealing with our anxiety and our stress and our unrest. And Jesus, all the while, is saying, wait a minute, I've come to bring peace. I am the Prince of Peace. I want to be born in your life. I want to be made manifest in your life. I want you to have peace. It's almost time for Christmas when we celebrate, and we're already celebrating, but to celebrate the birth of Christ. And we we realize that God is on the throne and he has enacted this plan to heal and to save the world. And the question for us is, are we receiving and living into and experiencing this gift of peace that God has for us? When our first human parents sinned, we lost the peace of God, and I'll be more specific, the shalom of God. Uh, If that's a word that you haven't really heard or focused on much, I'd encourage you to uh, do more reading and study of the word shalom. Because so often we think of peace as just the absence of conflict. But God's peace, God's shalom, is so much more than just an absence of conflict, but it's that state of living in the blessing and the provision and the joy of God. It's that word that means wholeness and well-being. And that is what God wants for us, not just the absence of peace, but to experience his shalom, his well-being, his blessing, his provision, that that harmony with God and with one another that he desires for us to have. And so we're going to be looking a little bit here at shalom and how that was lost in the Garden of Eden. The writer to Hebrews says in chapter 2, verses 14 to 15, Since the children have flesh and blood, since that we have flesh and blood, he, Jesus, too, shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of the enemy, of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Hebrews writes about how God loves us so much that when we, because we are in sin, we've lost that sense of shalom, that peace, that well-being of God, that Jesus took on humanity and stepped into our world to experience our brokenness so that we know that he was without sin, but he experienced brokenness, he experienced temptation, he experienced pain, 
But Jesus stepped into our world so that we know two things. Number one, that he knows what it's like for us to lose a loved one. He knows what it's like for us to be hurt. He knows what it's like for us to live in this broken world. But we also know that Jesus came and he's with us. And that's another great truth that brings us peace, is that Jesus knows our pain, but also he is with us. Jesus shared in our humanity, and so God became one, one of us, suffering, abuse, rejection, assault, sickness, loneliness, and hunger. All of these human feelings and conditions, Jesus has experienced and knows uh, what it's like. And he has come to restore our shalom, to restore our peace. On that first Christmas night, the angel appeared to the shepherds, and suddenly that angel was uh, gathered and surrounded by a great company of the heavenly host, and they were saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill to men. One of the main messages, that one of the main pieces of good news that came that first Christmas night was the announcement of peace, the peace of Christ, the Prince of Peace uh, has come. Again, Paul writes about it in this way in Colossians 1, 19 to 20. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus. That means that Jesus is fully God and fully human. And through Jesus, to reconcile to himself all things. So where sin separates us, alienates us, isolates us, destroys us, where sin pollutes the heart and the soul of, of, of each and every human being, through Christ, God is at work to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace, there's that word again, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And so when we look at the Advent mission, when we look at the mission of Jesus, we see that where sin separates, divides, and destroys, Jesus comes to reconcile, to heal, and to save. Everything that we've done wrong through sin God has come to make right through Christ and to restore shalom throughout the world. My question is, have you received the the great news of the shalom of God in your life? Do you pay attention daily, even moment by moment, to, to asking the question, God, what are you doing? What do you desire to do to bring your shalom into my life? that sense of well-being, that sense of your presence, that sense of your peace and blessing into my heart, into my marriage, into my home, into my family, into our community. You know, I I wasn't thinking about this earlier, but it just come to me that, you know, how our world and our nation desperately needs the shalom of God. We are in a a season, and and I don't want to pay attention to any one immediate event, but we are in a long extended season politically where it seems that people on both sides think that we're going to get our way through this by more investigations and more uh, accusations, and and both sides think that they're going to somehow win by just out out arguing or out um, litigating or out investigating the other side. And my concern is that just that I see no end to this on the horizon for the next few decades. You know, I've been thinking about this, you know, trying to trying to reflect on what it's like when a when a couple comes in for marital counseling. And it's always a concern when the number one focus of each spouse is to try to out argue and put in place the, the their spouse. And I think as long as each spouse is trying to gain the upper hand through constant argument and uh, trying to outsmart the other and trying to put down, there's never a sense of, you know, we're going to get through this and be okay when that's going on. It's not until they realize that, hey, wait a minute, we are a team here and what's between us should not be between us. This problem should not be between us, but it should be out in front of us, and we should be coming together and working on this together as a couple in love. And I know that's a lot harder when it's hundreds of politicians, but in general, so often we think, or we can get lost into the idea that the way to win is through uh, arguing and through putting people in their place, rather than saying, hey, wait a minute, what would it look like for God's shalom to come? What would it look like for us to do a better job of listening 
and learning from one another rather than just trying to outsmart and argue with one another. And I think that's, that's what it looks like for people to be reconciled, is not to try to win an argument or to win a battle, but to say, what would it look like for us to come together and learn from each other, to talk through this, to, to, to seek God's grace and truth, uh, not try to close myself off thinking that I already have all the answers and, 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 it, and you're the problem, not me, but to say, hey, you know, how can we work through this? How does God want to shed light? What, and, and to ask those questions, you know what it really takes for there to be reconciliation and healing? It takes somebody willing to say, hey, you know, I, this, I'm realizing what I've done wrong, and I need to apologize for that. Relationships are restored not through out-arguing the other, but through those, those humble words of, I'm so sorry I hurt you. I was wrong. Forgive me. That's how relationships are restored, not the constant battling and bickering. And Jesus, the Prince of Peace, has come, and do our lives reflect that the Prince of Peace is living and ruling our lives? And so let's just think about what this looks like. Are we living out a life of anxiety that's raging within us, or are we living as children of the Prince of Peace? You know, anxiety causes us to react with gossip and fear and anger. But when the Prince of Peace comes in, he causes us to respond with love and trust and faith and humility. Anxiety causes us to gossip about others. The peace of Christ causes us to pray for others and to think about where have I gone wrong in this situation and to work things out one-on-one. Anxiety causes us to cling to that bitterness. Peace causes us to believe the best about others and to trust in God's grace and to forgive them and let them go. Anxiety causes us to lose all sense of hope, but the mind of peace, the mind of Christ, reminds us that, wait, God is in control, and Jesus is on the throne. And Jesus wants to bring peace to our hearts and our minds today. One way that I want to focus on growing in this next year is to really pay attention to my thoughts and what I'm feeding my mind. And in Philippians 4, Paul writes all about this. And I think that each and every one of us would do well to focus on what am I putting in my mind and what am I reflecting? What, am I, what is cycling through my thoughts? And Philippians 4 says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. When our hearts are all frazzled and we're feeling anxious and envious and jealous and bitter, we're not rejoicing in the Lord. Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always, in Philippians 4. I will say it again, Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. You know what kind of heart can be gentle? A heart that's at peace. A heart that's all revved up and anxious and stressed is not going to respond with gentleness. Paul goes on, The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. You know what peace looks like? Presenting the request to God and saying, Lord, I trust you. I've talked to you about this. I believe you're in control and I'm leaving it in your hands. If there's a way that you want me to work and be responsible behind this prayer, reveal that to me, how I can act and and put this prayer into action. But Lord, I've made my request to you. I've presented my request to you. I know you've heard me. I know you love me. It's on your desk and I'm I'm gonna trust that you are at work. Paul says, present your request to God, and then he says, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I love that, how the peace of God guards our hearts and minds. How many of us need our hearts and our minds to be guarded by the peace of God, rather than our hearts and our minds revving up with anger, anxiety, stress, envy, bitterness, all of those things that can rob or steal the sense of shalom that God wants to bring to our lives. And Paul goes on in verse 8, and I love these verses right here. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, you know, when we're focused on stuff that are lies or deceit or things that are just ugly, it's hard to have peace. But Paul says, if you want peace, do this. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, there's a good word, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. 
If you want to have a heart of peace, think about those things that God has done that are praiseworthy and see what that does to your heart. And when you start praising God for the beauty of a child's face or the beauty of creation, when you praise God for the beauty of his plan for the church, when you praise God for those things that are glorious and praiseworthy, the peace of God can come in. Whatever you have learned, in verse 9, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And he even says this, and the God of peace will be with you. I was struck by those words, whatever, in Philippians. Because he, Paul uses the words whatever in a much different way than we often hear the word whatever in our society. How do we hear the word of whatever? I almost want to ask for somebody to, to describe the way. But you know, when somebody's not at peace, or somebody makes them mad, or somebody cuts them off in traffic, the, the whatever is a whatever. You know, it's almost like, I'm done with this person, whatever. And Paul uses whatever in a very different way. He says, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, whatever is praiseworthy, think about such things and the God of peace will be with you. And as we think about having peace in our lives, I want to ask you, what way is the word whatever used in your life? Is it just a constant focus on everything that's wrong and everyone who's not acting as they should and a whatever? Or is it a God I'm going to focus on whatever is true, whatever is lovely, whatever is noble, whatever is admirable, whatever is praiseworthy. I'm going to think about these things so that the God of peace can come and rule in my life and that I can be, I can be a person who experiences this shalom of God, this understanding that, yeah, not everything in my life is okay, but the God of peace is bringing forth his shalom in my life and I'm living into the plans of God and I'm trusting in him with my life, with my relationships, with my thoughts, and so how do you use that word whatever to say whatever, focusing on however you've been annoyed or offended or bothered, or is it, God, I'm going to focus on the whatever. Whatever is true, whatever is lovely, whatever is noble. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, I'll think about such things. So let's go back to 1968 as we close up. Something really awesome happened at the end of 1968, and it was a mission. We've been focused on that word mission and it was the, the NASA mission, the Apollo 8 mission, to go and orbit the moon. And it's the first, the first aircraft, the first time that anyone orbited around the moon, saw the back side of the moon, and the, the astronauts went and they orbited around the moon 10 times. And uh, I have a video clip. At the time, this was the most watched piece on TV in the history of TV. It had been around for like five years at that point. No, I don't know. I don't know. But it was, this was the most watched television event of all time. This is December 24th, Christmas Eve, 51 years ago, the Apollo 8 mission. And
we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. Circling the moon and sending that news back to earth. But after that event, in the days following that event, the astronauts received hundreds, if not thousands, of messages and telegrams. And they said that they were so powerful, it was just powerful to hear you know, how, that they, how they had inspired and brought some hope after such a dark and difficult year of assassinations and war and all of that. And they said all these telegrams were so inspirational and so great, but they said one stood out among all the others. And it was a telegram that simply said, you saved 1968. Because for over 11, 12 months of that year, the nation had just been focused on death and captivity and war and violence and all of these problems of the world. But in that moment, December 24th, 1968, it gathered an entire nation to come together. And instead of focusing on all the problems, they focused on what is praiseworthy, what is excellent, what is admirable, what is true, what is lovely. And they saw the beauty of God's creation and they read from God's word about the beauty of God and the power of God to create. And for just that one moment, it focused people on what is higher, what is better, what is praiseworthy. And it's just a little uh, kind of an image for us that every year for us is 1968. The days of our lives, unfortunately, are 1968. I didn't mean to make a soap opera reference there. But in the midst of our lives that are broken, in the midst of our lives where bad things happen, in the midst of our lives where God has not worked everything yet for his good, we can take our minds off the the broken and the mundane and we we can focus our gaze upward and we can focus on God, our creator, who is at work to restore and to love and redeem this world and the people he loves. And we can say, my life is not perfect. I'm still a mess but God's grace is at work in my life. And I choose not to focus on the whatevers of everything that's wrong, but I choose to focus on all the whatevers that God is doing right, that God is at work to heal, that I'm a child who has been saved by grace. I know that God lives in me and I will spend eternity with God both in this life and in the life to come. And that God is using me, not just working in my life for my own benefit, but God wants to work through me so that as his peace is cultivated my life, I can go around and be an agent of peace wherever I go. Because the Savior of the world, the Prince of Peace, has come and has been born in me. Is God shalom filling your life and overflowing into the lives of others? That sense that Jesus is on the throne and and, and God is working to bring his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. My life is in God's hands and I can open my heart for the grace of Jesus to rush in, to forgive my sin, to heal my life, to restore my hope, and to make me a child of God who is used for God's good purposes on this earth. May that be our prayer. Let's pray. Uh, I just encourage you to, to close your eyes and bow your heads. And if there's anyone who needs to just receive the peace of Christ into them, the grace of Jesus that forgives sin and, and makes lives new, I encourage you to just trust, trust in Christ and, and by faith, let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your love and your power at work within our lives and in our world. And God, in a, in a nation, in a world where there's so much turmoil and, and, and division, God, we pray that we would be people who are different from the world around us because you, Jesus, the Prince of Peace, lives in us. So Lord, come into our lives. Forgive our sins. Make us brand new today. Where there is anxiety and stress, Lord, we pray that you would cast that out and fill us with your peace. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Help us to be people of hope, people of faith, people of peace. God, I pray for anyone here who is weighed down by the burdens of conflict or envy or anger or bitterness. Jesus, I pray that they would just unclench their hands and let those things go and fall at your feet. And Lord, put within them a heart of trust. Put within them your grace that reminds them that you are at work to make all things new. God, I pray that wherever we can act, wherever we are responsible to to have a conversation or to serve someone or to admit our faults or failures, God, 
Help us to be obedient to the ways that you would call us to to seek peace in our lives and in our relationships. And God, come and, and work in us. We thank you for Jesus, the Prince of Peace. And Lord, we pray that you would be born in us, that you would be alive in us, that we would be people who uh, plant seeds of peace wherever we go because you are at work in us and through us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.